Alpha Society has put in to make this possible. Whether it's a virtual talk or an in-person talk, these programs have a lot of moving parts and it takes a lot of work to get them done. And I really wanna thank you guys for your efforts and your, your warmth and generosity. I really wanna thank everyone attending tonight uh, for your interest in wanting to learn more about OWLs and my work with them. And I know week day nights can be tricky and I really appreciate you spending part of your weekday evening with me and to learn more about the OWL. So thank you to one and all. And I'd really like to start tonight with a quick reassurance, even with Dennis's very generous introduction still ringing in your ears. I may need to reassure you that I'm the right person to talk to you about OWLs. And I say that because most of you are meeting me for the first time. And since you're meeting me for the first time, you're noticing things about me. And I'm sure high on that list of things you're noticing about me is the frankly appalling and ever-growing lack of hair on my head. So I may need to reassure you that I do, I really do study owls and not bald eagles. Now, bald eagles are really cool animals. I'm always excited to see a bald eagle, but I really do focus my efforts on studying owls. And anytime I talk about the owls and my work with them, whether it's something more formal like today, or just talking to a neighbor and a colleague, I mentioned that I study owls and have now been doing so for 15 years. The first and best question comes up really quickly, and that is, so how did this all begin? And that's really the key question, because this isn't something that you just oh, roll out of bed one day and decide to do. Like, oh, I'm just gonna go to the park and study out. So this began very gradually, very organically with two main seeds. And the first seed, I'm confident I share this with all of you tonight. Ever since I was a young child, I've had a strong interest in wildlife. And this interest has always been there, but I found in the early 2000s that this interest was really coming up to the forefront. And ever since I moved to St. Louis in 1995, I've lived close to Forest Park. And I thought, well, where can I study wildlife close to my home? And I realized, oh, put two and two together, study the wildlife in Forest Park. Now I'm presenting here for the Peoria Audubon Society and Dennis has mentioned that people have registered for this program from both not only for the Peoria area, but other areas of the country and perhaps uh, internationally. Um, so I want to say a few words about where I study these owls, about Forest Park in St. Louis, Missouri. And I would share these same slides if I was presenting right now in Peoria. St. Louis is about three hours or so from Peoria. It would be foolish of me to assume everyone knows about this park and anything about it. So that's one of the beautiful entrances to the park and the gorgeous fall foliage. First of all, Forest Park is very large. This picture you're seeing is showing you a lot of the park in a way it might look like, but it's actually showing you just a fraction of the park. It's a very large park, just under 1,300 acres, making it one of the largest urban parks in the United States. Just to put that into context, Forest Park is 500 acres larger than Central Park in New York City. So it's a very large park and people love Forest Park. People love the park for many different reasons. It's a, an oasis of nature, and peace away from the, the busy city. And it's also home to several of the St. Louis region's major cultural and educational institutions. For instance, right in the middle of this photo is the St. Louis Art Museum, and just to the east, to the left here, this is the St. Louis Zoo. So between all of these things, people come to Forest Park in great numbers. 13 million visitors use Forest Park per year. And just to put that figure in context, the population of the state of Missouri is 6 million people. Park is also very well regarded, and you can take my word for it, but I'd rather share with you this list of recent awards and accolades from national organizations and media outlets. So the park is not just loved in Forest Park, but it's very well respected uh, throughout much of the country and even the world. And while the park does have a lot of 
uh, things that make it the nature of oasis, uh, an oasis of nature, pardon me, um, you might be thinking, oh, it has turf grass and horticultural areas, and it does, but it also has great habitat diversity. There are two different types of forests. There are prairies, wetlands, woodlands, there are ponds, lakes, creeks, a river system, and approximately 45,000 trees put the forest in Forest Park. So there's a lot of wildlife in the park. So when I put two and two together in the early 2000s, I started to go to the park and I quickly fell in love with the park and its wildlife because I began to see and eventually photograph all sorts of amazing animals. Some I had seen before, like red-tailed hawks. And I'm sure everyone here has seen a red-tailed hawk, but I don't, I'm also confident of something else. Any day you see a red-tailed hawk, it makes that day just that much better. I began to see animals I'd seen maybe once or twice before, like muskrats. If you're not familiar with muskrats or large aquatic rodents, here it is swimming. Uh, just smaller than their cousin, the beaver, not quite, quite as big. Um, and it was amazing to see muskrats consistently now. I mean, I used to, I'd seen one or two, and I can't even count how many I've seen now. I also began to see animals I had never seen before, like coyotes. Now, I did not take this photo. My friend Edward Krim did. Um, but I did see those same coyotes on the very same morning, December 21st, 2009. And these coyotes were not in some wild, remote area of the park. No, they're about 100 yards from the front doors of the St. Louis Art Museum. You saw that aerial photograph. Now, unlike me, Edward is a professional photographer. I, on the other hand, I am a naturalist who takes pictures. And while I hope you enjoy my photos and videos tonight, I definitely want to make that distinction very clear, if not to you, at least to, at least to me. I think it's a very important distinction. And I found myself more than ever before in my life really taking a closer look and learning more and spending more time checking out birds, birds like this great egret in mid-snap. So the park was just a total treasure trove and continues to be so for me. And I was spending a lot of time there, but I had not seen owls. I knew there were owls in the park from reputable sources, both in person and in print but I wasn't seeing them, nor was I surprised. I knew very little about owls, but I knew that owls were really hard to find. And owls are hard to find for three key reasons. One, for camouflage is amazing. It's not just color, it's texture, it's behavior. They're mostly active at night. And if that wasn't enough, they fly fast and silently. So I was not looking for owls. I was never expecting to see owls. But one day, I finally saw owls without even trying. Now, this day, I wish I had written the date down. As you heard, I studied history. And history is more than dates and names. But dates and names are still pretty important. What I can tell you is late August, early September 2005. And at this point in my life and career, I worked on the east side of Forest Park and lived, pardon me, I worked on the west side of Forest Park, and I lived on the east side of Forest Park. And on this particular day, I had a really long, tough day at work. We've all been there. And I thought as the day started to finally end, I need to de-stress, I need to decompress, I need some nature time. I'm not gonna commute home in my normal fashion. I'm going to walk home through the park and it's gonna, I'm going to feel better in five minutes, never mind 45, 50 minutes when I arrived home. And it was such a long day at work that by the time I left work, the sun was already starting to set. And by the time I got to this particular natural area of the park, the sun had set quite a bit, if not completely, uh, but there's still a little light around. But I was walking in this area and I was walking past this big dead tree. And that tree is still there 15 years later. And I was about 100 feet past this tree when out of nowhere, I heard hooting. And again, I put two and two together. I'm hearing hooting. It's getting dark. This has to be owls. And I went back, and in this dead tree were two great horned owls. 
Again, I knew very little about owls, but I knew enough to know that they're bright horn owls. Very big, and with things on top of their heads that I was pretty sure were not horns, but I thought they might be ears. I learned later they're just groups of feathers called tufts, the more technical term, plumicorns. So I was really excited because I had only seen an owl once before, 14 years later, on the other side of the planet, in a park near my granny's home near Johannesburg, South Africa. So here I was seeing owls for the second time and in my life and the first time in Forest Park. And I was really lucky because that first sighting was incredible. In 20 to 30 minutes, I saw the owls hooped together in a duet, a beautiful vocal and visual display. I saw them fly several times, ethereal, fast, gorgeous. But the owls weren't done. The owls still had a cherry on top moment yet to provide. And that occurred when, much to my shock, one of the owls went after a great blue heron, a bird twice the size of a great horned owl and a powerful predator in its own right. And this heron was terrified and it flew out of there squawking and croaking in alarm and panic like so. That was one terrifying great blue heron. I was one completely hooked naturalist. These owls had taken my love of Forest Park and its wildlife and poured gasoline on that fire. I walked home, my eyes doing very good impressions of saucers. So I got home and I told my girlfriend all about it. And I paused and I thought, what do I know about owls? Practically nothing. Let's change that. Time to hit the books. This is the first book on owls that I owned. I bought it serendipitously a few years earlier at a library book sale. And I pulled it off the shelf and it turned out to be a great book with which to start. And I've had the, the honor and pleasure to mentor several people about owls. And I've always started them with this book, Owls by Common Tooth. But I didn't stop there. I have a few additional books in the meantime. I now have over 50 books on owls. And I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir to a great extent, but for folks newer to studying nature, and it could be ferns, moss, lizards, owls, what have you, anytime you study something in nature, you have to do the field work and the homework. You've got to sit in your favorite chair and learn the facts. What I'm sharing with you tonight is not just from a lot of field work, but also tons of research but you also have to put on your boots and go out there and get muddy and dirty and sweaty and see things with your own eyes and ears. And what's great is that each type of work helps and inspires the other type of work. To this day, I continue to see owl behavior that makes me say, what the heck was that? I need to keep doing my homework. And I'll be doing my homework, learning a new fact or getting an additional nuance of, of something I thought I knew very well already. And my feet will get itchy. I have to go out into the field and apply what I know. And with a lot of homework and a lot of field work, but also very important collaboration, what we're doing tonight, sharing information, with all those things working together, I began to see that same pair of vowels regularly. And as such, I had to name them. And I named them Charles and Sarah. And here they are, absolutely gorgeous great horned owls. And great horned owls are indeed great. You are looking at a very large owl. Great horned owls are the third tallest owl in North America, between 18 and 25 inches tall. So a foot and a half, just over two feet tall. With that height comes a lot of weight. Great horned owls are the second heaviest owl in North America, weighing between two to five pounds. Now, if you look at this picture, Charles is on the left, the male, and Sarah, the female, is on the right. You're probably noticing the difference in size. Well, in the birds of prey, owls, hawks, eagles, vultures, and falcons, almost categorically, the females are larger. Now, Charles is a large male. Sarah, huge female, 23 to 25 inches tall, as big as they get. Now, incredibly important fact about great horned owls, and this is going to color and form a lot of what we talk about tonight, is where great horned owls live. 
we are talking about the most widespread commonly found owl in North America. These guys were found in every state except Hawaii, every province and territory of Canada, and much of Latin America. This is a massive geographic range. It's one of the biggest of any bird of prey on the planet. And out of this huge geographic range comes a bit of a paradox, bit of a push, bit of a pull. On one hand, great horned owls are really easy to study because you can find them in so many different places, so many different habitats. But at the same time, this makes them challenging to study and to generalize about. So with great horned owls, there are huge variations in diet, territory size, population density, where they nest, when they nest. Another way to think of this is, let's take our friend the letter A. This is an owl that lives in Alaska, Alberta, Arizona, Arkansas, Alabama, and I've run out of fingers, Argentina. So think of how different those places are. Rainfall, climate, topography, you name it. So with great horned owls, huge variations in many aspects of their behavior. So to study them, I go out very frequently, an average night, uh, average week, I'm out there six to seven nights a week. That comes out to over 300 nights a year. And I do this for two main reasons. One, you can't keep me away. I love doing this, totally addicting. Two, it also gives me a lot of data with which to work on many different aspects of the owl's behavior. Where are they perching? Where are they hunting? What are they hunting? Do we see them drop pellets? Are we seeing courtship behavior? what's going on. So I can compare what I saw briefly today, I went right after work, to what I saw in about three and a half hours yesterday, three hours, beg your pardon, um, and compare that to the day before, the week before, the year before, things like that. Timing is definitely key. The best time to go looking for most owls is about an hour before sunset. You have some light with which to work, and this is when the owls are starting to wake up and become active. The right gear and the right clothes are also important. You're seeing me here wearing the proper attire to present even from the comforts of my own home. I think it's important to dress properly when you're presenting. I do wanna reassure you this is not what I wear when I go out to study the owls. This is what I look like when I go out to study the owls. Dark muted colors, you never see me wearing a bright white shirt. Boots, backpack, cameras, binoculars. And yes, the car with the license plate, Alman, that's my ride. Now, since I have so many sharp-eyed birders, naturalists, and other keen-eyed people, you're probably noticing that the facial hair in the photo matches the facial hair coming over the interwebs tonight. Well, what you're seeing in both cases is winter plumage. There is a spring plumage and a summer plumage, just to give you a little preview there. So as I'm out about an hour before sunset, the owls are starting to wake up. And how do they wake up? What do they do when they wake up? Well, they do what most animals do, ourselves included, when they wake up. They stretch and groom. This is Charles doing one of two stretches they do. I call this the escalator stretch. That'll become very clear. And that massive expanse of wing and feathers you're seeing, that is only one wing. The wingspan of the great horned owl four to five feet wide. So let's watch Charles do an escalator stretch and you'll see why I call it this. So as they stretch out the wing on the same side of their body, they stretch out their leg and toes. Got a little hung up there, I'm afraid. But you can see it looks like an escalator unfolding. And it's just a beautiful, beautiful sight to see. Now, grooming is also very important. Here's Charles demonstrating the amazing neck flexibility that all owls have. He is grooming his tail feathers with his bill. So his head is back, turned very, very far away. And he's actually pulling the tail feathers through his bill. And this grooming is really important, keeping their feathers, their bodies in good shape, 
keeping them, which will allow them to stay warm, to stay dry, and helps ensure their silent flight. Now, let's watch Charles do a little grooming in the summer of 2019. And they groom different parts of their bodies in different ways. You know, I brush my teeth with one device and my hair with a very different one. Um, so this is him grooming some of his lower tummy and upper legs. Now, I've seen some of these behaviors literally thousands of times, but it never gets old. It's just as beautiful, just as fascinating, just as compelling. Never mind seeing all these variations. There are nights, for example, with stretching and grooming, where they do a ton of stretching and grooming, and other nights, very little. And there, that was a nice long escalator stretch. We saw both in the photo and video. There's another one they do that's a little more angular, not quite as long. But I also love the fact that every night is different and every night is unique. Not only these little nuances, but things that you might see only once or twice. What I'm going to show you next is a behavior I've only seen twice. This was in a very dry period in September 2015. It hadn't rained for two weeks. And if it's raining when the owls are starting to wake up, they're generally not too thrilled with it. They just kind of work it. Well, on this night, in this very dry period, Charles moved out to the top of a bear tree. And you're not going to see one wing. You're going to see both wings and his tail feathers spread out as he takes a shower. And this wasn't a light summer shower. This was capital R rain. And he made the most of it. I've seen that twice in 15 years of studying these owls. I love the shaking of the tail feathers at the end. Now, one behavior I don't see every night, but sometimes I might get a, a little streak of it, uh, maybe three nights out of five, but then I might go weeks, even months sometimes without seeing it, are the owls ejecting pellets. If you look at this picture of Sarah here, you know she's leaning over very far, and there's something in her mouth. That, is a pellet coming out of her mouth. Now, some of you are probably like me in present day 2021, and you're thinking to yourself, yes, I'm familiar with owl pellets. I have dissected owl pellets. Others of you might be like me back in 2005, and you're saying, what's a pellet? Well, this is a pellet. All the things the owls cannot digest, fur, bones, feathers, insect exoskeletons, seeds undigested by the animal that the owl ate and now undigested again by the owl. All of those things get compacted in the owl's gizzard, key part of their digestive tract, and then ejected out of their mouth. Now, when they eject a pellet, it's a totally natural process, but it's not especially present. pleasant, I should say. Um, it's a lot like a cat with a fur ball. And like a cat with a fur ball, soon after they get it out, often it's very traumatic and dramatic, and it should be scored with an aria by Puccini or Verdi. And then a few seconds later, <coughs> they're fine. Now, before we watch a video of one of the owls ejecting the pellet, I want to give you a hint, a tease of some of the things that great horned owls can eat. And this next pellet is, uh, that next picture is of a pellet 
that contained the first partially intact skull I had ever found in one of their pellets. And this skull is the skull of a wood duck, a bird only a little smaller than a great horned owl, a bird that flies with great speed, with great agility, but the owls caught, killed, ate, and digested that wood duck. So with that in mind, let's watch Charles drop a pellet. I actually saw him drop a pellet in this same tree on Saturday. And yeah, a few seconds later, it is all good. Now I love the head twist at the end. That was the first time I had seen that. I've only seen that head shake to the right shoulder a handful of times. I had never seen it to the left shoulder until about two years ago. I've only seen it twice now. So again, every night different, every night unique. Now for much of uh, the northern part of North America, this is a great time to be hearing many owls, including great horned owls. This is one of their most vocal times. And when they hoop together, it's called a duet. And duets are thought to have a couple of main purposes. One, a territorial defense and declaration. This is our territory, not yours, stay the heck out. This is also how a new pair courts and how an established pair builds and maintains their pair bond. The breeding cycle of great horned owls is the longest of any owl in North America. Seven to nine months, mating, nesting, and raising their young. You can't have such an intense breeding cycle on a first date, tinder, single bar basis. You need to have a really good pair bond. And great horned owls also make identifying male and female easier vocally, because if you look at size, it can be tough. Because remember, the females are bigger. But here's Sarah, higher up on the right and further away from the camera. There's Charles, who is smaller, lower down and further away from the camera. It's kind of hard to tell just looking at them who's the male and who's the female. But by hearing them, it's 98, 99% of the time very clear. You're going to hear low, long, few, deep notes from the male about four to six notes the female softer shorter higher notes and more of them about six to nine and it's just gorgeous gorgeous to hear them it's even better to hear them and see them so let's watch charles and sarah duet now this is early in a duet this is kind of what I call first gear. Duets go up to, uh, they go up to fifth gear. So they're just starting off. Here's Charles higher on the right, Sarah lower down on the left. And as you listen to them, who watch how their bodies move as well. <laughs> So you just notice them leaning over. When they hoot, it's a full body motion. We can see our fellow human and say hello and barely move anything. Their vocalization involves their whole body. And notice how this white patch on the front fills up and gets bigger. Well, that white patch on the throat is called the guler sac. G-U-L-A-R-S-A-C, no K. And guler sac is bright white. And notice also how they lift up their tail feathers. On the other sides of their tail feathers, also bright white. 
So as it gets darker and darker and darker, these bright white feathers will pop like the beam of a lighthouse. So it's a vocal display. Hey, you're going to hear us. It's a visual display. Hey, you're going to see us. So really, really cool to see. And as the, the duet gets more intense, they'll even overlap in their hooting. Uh, Charles makes these really cool purring and cooing notes when he hoots when the duet is getting really intense. So always just a thrill to hear and see a duet. Now, one of the hardest things, if not the hardest thing to do with the owls is to find them when they go off to hunt. I call this reacquiring the owl. And it's very challenging, but incredibly rewarding. And I'm going to show you why it's so challenging. This is a very typical video of Charles going off to hunt. And I'm going to play you the video with very little introduction. And after the video, I'm going to ask you a couple of rhetorical questions. I'll provide the answer. So, how far did Charles go? No idea. He flew out of sight. Where did Charles land? Yeah, I also don't know. I couldn't see how far he went. Therefore, I don't know where he landed. Is it getting any lighter outside? Not at all. It's getting darker and darker by the second. Early on, this is when I would go home. Wow. I saw a lot of cool stuff with the owls. Sarah ejected a pellet. Did a really nice duet. Charles did a double wing stretch and Sarah did two escalator stretches. But now I'm going to go home because there's no way in heck that I'm going to be able to find them again. But I realized that hunting is a huge part of their daily lives. It's a huge part of their lives overall. And if I didn't try to find them and watch them hunt, I would never succeed. So very hard to do so, but so rewarding. And one of the things that makes it so rewarding is when you get a sight like this. A beautifully silhouetted great horned owl, in this case, Sarah, doing the main method of great horned owl hunting. Perch and wait, look and listen. Perch and wait, look and listen. They are very patient hunters. I've watched them hunt from one branch of one tree for 10 minutes and 20 minutes and 30 minutes and 60 minutes and one night, 90 minutes. Now, what they eat is just one of the many things that blew my mind and hooked me even further on Great Horn Owls. They eat many of the things you would expect them to, rodents, rabbits, small birds, but they also eat a wide variety of other small animals, including fish, amphibians, reptiles, and quite small animals, including insects, worms, and other invertebrates. That wasn't too shocking to me. You know, an animal that can eat a rabbit can also eat a beetle. What was much more shocking to me was to learn that great horned owls eat a wide range of small to medium-sized animals. Great horned owls eat raccoons, skunks, muskrats, minks, pet owners. These guys eat small, domestic dogs, they eat domestic cats. Remember our wood duck skull? You bet. Great horned owls eat ducks, geese, hawks, other owls. Remember the great blue heron that was so terrified? They eat great blue herons that are twice their size, along with other herons and egrets, and other waterfowl, coots, you name it, rails. Great horned owls eat wild turkeys. Just back to mammals for a second. There's a recorded instance in Arizona of a great horned owl killing and eating a bobcat. So in Forest Park, whether we're talking about the Forest Park in Peoria or Forest Park in St. Louis or the nice suburb of Atlanta, great horned owls eat almost everything. There's only a handful of things they can't eat. Everything else is on the menu. So they're right at the top of the food chain, an apex predator and absolutely fascinating to watch hunt. One of the more dramatic things to see them hunt for 
are bats in midair. And I'm going to show this video a couple of times because it happens very quickly. Uh, in this video, Sarah is going to come from the right side of the screen, back from the left, and the magic will occur in the middle. There it goes. Whoa, going for bat. Jeez. I also do my own color commentary, free of charge. So let's play that a little more slowly. Here comes Sarah, like a bat out of, I don't know. Here comes Sarah very, very fast. And here comes the bat. Now, bats are hard to catch. Small, agile, and yes, they have echolocation. And I wonder, I wonder what a great hornell looks like on a bat's sonar scope, for lack of a better phrase. But needless to say, the bat says, oh, bloody heck, I'm going to die. I need to get the heck out of here. But Sarah says, well, not so fast. I'm hungry. I would like to catch and eat you. So let's back up to Sarah just for a moment. Notice she's coming along, flying very, very straight. She sees the bat, and then, whoa, look at her go. She pulls this very tight, high G, fighter pilot, top gun, Jedi Knight turn. And instead of trying to catch the bat with her bill, she lowers her talons to try and catch the bat with her talons, to literally try and pluck it out of thin air. Now the bat is only one wing length away from Sarah. Sarah realizes, nope, missed it. She tucks up her legs and talons and flies off. And if you look at the bottom left of your screen at the timestamp, you'll see that only took one second. All of that action, one second. Now that we have seen it broken down and analyzed a little more, let's watch it not sped up, but at the actual speed at which it occurred. There it goes. Whoa, going for bad. Jeez. And whether they miss a bat or catch a bat, it's always that exciting. Now, it's really important that they catch food, that they have a lot of food to eat, not only for themselves, but for mouths to feed. And Charles and Sarah have been quite successful. 23 outlets since 2006. And we'll look at a few outlet highlights here. Uh, 2008 was a very big year. It was the first year I saw them have three outlets. Two to three is average for great horned owls. And it was the first year that I named the owls. And yes, I named them Bart, Lisa, and Maggie, because I'm a big fan of the symptom. But also for good scientific reasons, because the young hatch in the order in which the eggs have been laid. And the eggs are laid as frequently one to two days apart, but sometimes two to five days apart. And the first egg that is laid, the female starts the incubator. So that first egg laid has a real head start on the second and the second on the third. Four to five eggs is very rare, but it has been documented with great one out. So I really wanted names that gave me an age order. 2012 yielded one of my favorite outlet photos of Christopher and Velvet. And yes, if you're going, if you're at home and going, oh, that's more than okay. The Alice are incredibly cute and sweet, and they're so sweet, in fact, I'm confident, very confident that they can give Vladimir Putin diabetes. Another favorite Alice photo came from the following year, three again, Lawrence, Edward, and Stuart. And I love this photo for two main reasons. One, it takes me back to that beautiful May day where I was walking through the woods, and there they were. Hey, Mark. But it also shows that, uh, how intense that difference in age and size and maturity can be. On the right here is the oldest owlet, Lawrence, who looks much more like an adult, especially compared to the youngest owlet here on the left, Stuart. And Edward, the middle child, is in the middle of both of them, both literally and figuratively. So fascinating to see these age differences. In this year, they fledged, they left the nest in age order, and they dispersed, leaving the parents' territory also in a order. And one more Alec photo. This is of Grace and Carol, the two they had in 2015, Sarah feeding them. 
And I want to point out a key, key thing about Great Horned Owl young. These allets that are really, really big, only a little smaller than their mom, these allets are two months old. Great Horned Owls hatch from a very modestly sized egg, about the size of a chicken egg. They hatch from that egg and then grow physically like weeds on steroids. So their bodies go pow, but their abilities take a long, slow, gradual time to catch up. Human parents, grandparents, aunts, uncles, imagine a human child with the body of a teenager and the abilities of a toddler. And that's what you're dealing with. And the young mature so slowly, that's why great horned owls have such a long breeding cycle. Now, out of that long breeding cycle, there is a key generalization that you can make about great horned owls, whether they're in Maine, Maryland, Missouri, Montana, or Mexico. Anywhere you have great horned owls, they are one of the first, if not the very first, bird to nest. Now, the time of nesting will vary depending on where you are, but it's usually going to be one of the first or the first birds to nest. So let's watch some owlet antics. One of the things I love about the owlets is they're so active and learning and gradually, gradually improving their flying skills and landing skills. And this is a, a video of the three owlets they had in 2010, Reese, Malcolm, and Dewey. I always like to show Malcolm in the middle. And they're playing a classic youngster game, whether you're an owl or a human, follow the leader. One owlet flies to a branch and the others follow. And these owlets are only two months old, but it was a windy spring day. And you're gonna notice how huge they are, but how clumsy they are. And also listen for that raspy begging call is the owlets calling their parents for food. So successful follow the leader. Three outlets all in the one, all in the same branch. But you saw how big they were. You saw how clumsy they are. Those were only two month old outlets. Now part of learning how to land is learning where not to land. These are the outlets from the following year, uh, Dalton and Monica. And watch what happens. There comes Monica. Oh, right about the brother. Branch broke. That was one of those things like, oh, it's funny because it all turned out okay. If that outlet had missed that branch, it hadn't caught another branch, it could have been really bad. It could have been injury, which would often lead to death. A lot of outlets do not make it to their first birthday. Some of those will not make it to birthday two. But if they can get past the first two to three years, they're going to be okay. Another aspect of the owls that I love is their curiosity. The whole world is new to them. And I hope this video will be a good example. This is Grace, uh, one of the owls they had in 2015. First on a low branch of a fallen tree and a firefly, a lightning bug began to fly around her. And she's totally captivated by it. And again, you're gonna see that amazing neck flexibility that, they, uh, that all owls have. And I don't care how much yoga you've done, don't try this at home or anywhere else. Um, but watch how curious she is about the firefly. Firefly back again. Yeah. 
And this is all happening in a huge city park, and I'm very confident for many of you close to your home. I really encourage you to go out and see it and see more of it. Uh, my only warning is, yeah, it's really addictive. Now, just a few weeks after I shot that video, we had a very sad development. Sarah died. On July 18th, 2015, I found Sarah in a very unusual area of their territory. And from her posture and the expression that you see here, I knew she was ill or injured. And I found her before sunset. And I stayed with her for an hour after sunset. And all of the grooming and stretching and calling we've seen, she did nothing. She just was perched on that branch. And I was very concerned. And I came back the very next day and she was in the same spot. Now, owls can and will perch in one spot, sometimes for multiple days in a row, but there's such a qualitative difference in her behavior that told me that she had not left. And again, no stretching, no grooming, no hooting. Charles flew over that night, relatively close to her, called, and not only did Sarah not respond to Charles, she didn't even look in his direction. And the analogy that I could not avoid was this was like looking at someone you know, someone you care about at the hospital. And you think, wow, you don't look well, you're not where you should be, you're not doing what you should be, and you're not getting better. And Sarah's there for uh, 36 hours. The last I saw her was the morning of July 20th. Uh, and my friends and I searched all over for her body, never found her body, and she is, to this day, incredibly missed the most amazing female Great Hordell I will probably ever see as an individual, as a mate with Charles, as a partner, as a mom, just mind boggling. So Sarah's really special Al. So that was a tough morning to, to see, and it just got tougher as we continued not to see her. But through this sad time were two very important silver linings. One, the outlets had reached a critical point in their maturity. At a certain point, the parents will stop feeding them. It helps encourage the outlets to disperse. And it's tough to see. The outlets are, they're not fully independent yet, but it, has to be done. And Charles and Sarah had already stopped feeding the two outlets they had that year, Grace and Harold. And if Sarah had died in June or earlier, the outlets probably would have died as well. There are documented cases of successful single parenthood, but trust me, those are very much the exception to the rule. The other silver lining was I had never seen courtship. I had read about Great Horn Owl courtship but I had never seen it. Charles and Sarah were already a pair when I came upon them. So I thought, well, let's see what happens next. And what happened next has been literally a now over five year period of nonstop owl drama. Whirlwind begins. And it began with Charles courting and finding a mate in 2015. He courted with two females in September of 2015. But courting is dating. It doesn't always work out, and it didn't work out with them. Third female showed up uh, early in October, and they courted and courted, and December 7th, they mated and became a pair. Beautiful female named Olivia. Small female, as you'll see in the next photo, uh, about the same size as Charles, maybe a little smaller. So there's Charles on the left and Olivia on the right. Now, while Charles and Olivia mated, she did not nest. She did not pick the site, lay eggs, and incubate it. And that was really interesting to see. I read in, in the course of my research that yes, nesting doesn't always happen. And if it does happen, it's not always successful. So it was very interesting to see a year without nesting. Now, this year became even more different as we got into uh, kind of the middle of the spring, late March, early April. Olivia started to spend time away from Charles. Some nights I would find her a few hundred yards away. Some nights I would find her over a half mile away. And some nights I wouldn't find her at all. And then 
regardless of where she was or where she wasn't, then she'd be back with Charles. And there is no pattern to this. Gone for two nights, back for one, gone for four, back for two. There was no pattern at all. Every night it soon became, will I see Olivia? And if so, where? But I think her not nesting and spending this time away from Charles created a vacancy. And vacancies get filled. Nature of horrors a vacuum. And a few weeks later, in April of 2016, a larger and very aggressive female showed up and quickly shoved out Olivia and started to chase Charles around. This is the intruding female on the second or third night that she was there, and she is perched in one of the trees that Charles and Olivia were regularly perching in at that time. Imagine leaving your home for work or an errand or what have you, and you come back and there in your favorite chair in the living room is a complete and total stranger saying, hello. Hmm. Could I have another one with a little more ice? How would you react? Well, Charles was not happy about this because this female was chasing him around, but eventually Charles adapted. 10 days later, they began to court. So with this female being so aggressive, I had to have a name that captured her aggressive behavior, not only towards Olivia, but towards Charles. And I quickly decided on the name Samantha, as in the character Samantha from the TV show Sex and the City. So boom, a new pair out of nowhere, Charles and Samantha. And Charles and Samantha did nest in 2017 and 2018. Uh, all three nesting attempts, they actually attempted nesting twice in 2018, were in this same hollow. And you can see Samantha very well hidden at the bottom lip of the hollow there. You can see the top of her ghoulish sack in her eyes. So they really tried, but no young, I don't know if no young hats, but if young hats, no, none survived. I never saw Alex at all. So, but fascinating to see these very different years. Uh, with all sorts of different behaviors. As we got into 2019, a new nest spot was chosen. This had never been used before. And you can ever so slightly see Samantha right here in this crack in this uh, snag in the cottonwood. And Samantha did nest, but very briefly, two nights, then she stopped. And then about a week later, she nested for one night. And during that whole period of winter 2018, 19, and into the early spring, we were concerned about Samantha's health. And this concern became far too real. Samantha died on April 3rd, 2019. She had a very confusing and gradual decline. Throughout the winter and early spring, Simultaneously, she was showing signs of possible illness or injury, and at the same time, robust health. It was very, very odd. The, the, the zenith and nadir of this was on March 1st, 2019. I was out with my friend, Brenda Henty, one of the people I've mentored, and we found Samantha not moving, spread out in the low branch of the tree, and we thought she was dead. 20 minutes later, she was grooming and then flying off with prey she had uncatched from a hiding spot and flying at great speed. It was like seeing somebody unconscious on the sidewalk and 20 minutes later, they're brushing themselves off and okay, go to work. Things became much clearer in late March when she took a really bad turn. A uh, park visitor reported to the nonprofit conservancy Forest Park Forever that uh, maintains, sustains, and just this amazing work with Forest Park that they had seen her on the ground and getting attacked by a red-tailed hawk. A red-tailed hawk would not mess with a healthy prey cornell. So that really told us that she was in bad shape. We were able, through a great joint effort of uh, Humane Society of Missouri, Forest Park Forever, to get her to one of the two local Raptor Rehabilitation Facilities in the St. Louis area, the World Bird Sanctuary, huge efforts by the World Bird Sanctuary. 
she received great care, but she was just far too ill. A post-death post examination called a necropsy uh, revealed the worst bacterial infection the hospital staff at the World Fair Sanctuary had ever seen. Uh, an infection that had spread from multiple vital organs, including the liver and the kidneys. So again, another sad time. And two days later, I'm in the park and I'm watching Charles and I wonder aloud if and when I'll see another female. And I turn my head and about 30, 40 feet away is this female, literally across the way from Charles. Very large female, uh, a lot like Sarah. Samantha was a big female, not as big as Sarah, not as big as this female. They had a great courtship duet that night. Really interested to see this and had to name her. And I named her Danielle. And a really interesting female. But things soon became very interesting in a way I never would have expected. Charles moved his territory in the middle of May, a half mile to the east. This is part of his hunting ground. It was like seeing a neighbor, not on your street, not on your block, but now living in the grocery store. Like, whoa, that's weird. Why he did this, I really don't know. Several possible reasons, either taken individually or cumulatively, but nothing that made me say, well, of course he did this because A happened or B happened. So very odd to see this and very challenging not in some ways not the most welcome challenge but still an interesting challenge because that was back to the drawing board i had to learn his new perch and roost spots danielle was over there as well but she was very hit or miss but i had to learn some of her spots so it was a really challenging time and he was there for five months finally moving back in mid-october 2019 to his historic territory uh, this is one of his favorite hooting spots, the Cottonwood Catalpa, we call this tree. So I was very happy to see that. But at this time, we were, again, Danielle was just only showing up here and there. And this was especially odd, because the great Hornells in this part of their range, for a new couple, this is when the fall is when they court and build up to mating the nesting. And Danielle was here, there, I had two periods in the fall of 2019 of over 10 consecutive days, one of 12 days, one of 16 days of not seeing Danielle. And it was really odd. It was like, should the wedding's coming around the corner and you guys have to get to know each other. So finally, in mid-December, she became more consistent and began nesting on New Year's Eve. And there she is. Uh, in the hollow where Sarah nested in 2008 and in 2012. Unfortunately, the nest failed. On February 18th, I saw Danielle come back to the hollow from one of her brief breaks and she did not get back in. I saw her aggressively build clacking at something in the nest. And given the context and other things, I'm far too confident that raccoons got in the nest and the eggs were either about to hatch or just had hatched. Now, in fairness to the raccoons, remember great horned owls, they eat raccoons, and I saw the owls make several attempts on raccoons during the nesting season alone, never mind over the year. So after that, I kind of got back to their normal. Charles in the territory, often quite vocal. Danielle was going back to being really hit or miss, just being showing up here and there. Um, it's very interesting to see that. And then things, once again in mid-May, became really odd. Now, in mid-May of 2019, it took me 10 days to find Charles using a different part of his range and his territory. That was the longest I had ever gone without seeing Charles. Well, May of 2020, it became another fun aspect of 2020. I did not see Charles for six weeks. And I was incredibly lucky to have a lot of help from many friends to search wide and far. And we did not hear or see him. And after six weeks, 
I made the very tough call that he was almost certainly dead. And it was really tough to share more bad news in 2020. And there is a, a very touching outpouring of grief about this. And I kept an eye on this territory. I wanted to see if another owl would move in there. And two weeks after making this tough call, there's Charles back in his territory on July 13th. Hi, what did I miss? So huge amount of celebration uh, across the St. Louis region and, and even beyond about the return of Charles, who's okay. Saw him very consistently after that. I was just fascinated. I don't know where he was. I have some hints based on some of his behavior since then and a few reports from other people about where he may have been some of the time, but we were looking in that area quite regularly. So a very tough time, but a great relief to see him again. Now, Danielle, in the meantime, she has been all mixed. We have not seen Danielle since the middle of March. And this has been a very, the last few months have been extra different because we've had a fall with not only no sign of Danielle, but Charles without a mate, not for lack of trying. Charles was advertising by cooling and other behaviors big time for a mate. For example, this is Charles on Thanksgiving night calling, calling, not only defending his territory and declaring his territory, but saying, ladies, I'm here, I'm available. Now he did court uh, with a female very briefly in October uh, and most recently on November 1st. Um, but we also saw that female on one of those nights courting with another male. And I was open to everything that maybe Danielle would show up and maybe Charles wouldn't find a mate or maybe something else. And it was looking like something else. And a female, possi possibly the female he courted with in the fall, showed back up on January 4th, literally last week. And they courted and they mated. We saw her again the following day on Tuesday, but a much different time. So better made than never. And then she disappeared. We didn't see her until Saturday. And then we've seen her every day since then. But on January 10th, after mating with Charles, literally minutes after mating with Charles, she was hooting with and flew over to that other nearby male. So is she just trying to figure out who's the best match, who's the fittest male, who's got the best hunting territory, the best nesting spot? Not sure. Now, thankfully, we've seen her now in the past four or five days every day, um, and we have seen them mate almost every day. So I'm still waiting a little. I want to see another night or two of her with Charles, um, she may also be nesting. She's doing some behaviors. So she is in that hollow that you've seen a few times now um, before making the call that yes, this is a new female. There are new, this is, we have a new pair and I also have to think of a name for her. Um, but I wanna, I wanna make sure that it's really sticking before I do that. So it's been a very interesting, very different uh, last five, six, seven months, um, but fascinating to see. Um, one of the things about Charles trying to find a mate is that their mating cycle is uh, very brief. But breeding, uh, the actual mating period itself is only four to six weeks. Um, and we're getting close to the end of it. And Charles was basically trying to find a, a date for prom. Prom's on a Friday, and Charles was trying to find a date on Wednesday. But it's looking good that maybe he has found one. To conclude, I just want to say that this was only a taste of the, my many years of studying these great horned owls. And there's many ways you can learn more about the owls and my work with them. Uh, very obviously, and uh, hopefully I say, I'd please ask the Audubon Society to have me back. I have three other talks on the owls, one just on hunting and feeding. It's such a meaty topic. Uh, another talk just on mating, nesting, and owlets. And then my latest talk, how to find an owl in your neighborhood. And I would love to do each and every one of these talks 
for the Peoria Audubon Society. Uh, so please consider that, Dennis and company. You can also find me online, and I'll share this slide in a moment, so you don't have to scribble everything. Dennis is also going to be sending it out an email as well. But yeah, a lot of different online presence. Uh, my YouTube page, there's tons of videos of the owls. I co-administer uh, a Facebook community called Great Horned Owls. Uh, and you can also find me on Twitter, at Forest Park Owl. If you're ever in the St. Louis area, if you do live in the St. Louis area, I want to invite you all to join me for an owl prowl. Not all 40 plus people at once. Uh, but a, an owl prowl is a lot of fun. We go out about an hour before sunset. It's that key time again um, for about two hours. And I lead them all year long, a never ending cycle, weekdays, weekends. And let's see, yeah, I lead them all the time. 76 in 2019, 2020, I led 65. Uh, not bad for a pandemic. Speaking of the pandemic, do have to have smaller groups for owl prowls, only one to four people, uh, stay masked, stay in distance. For an owl prowl, please email me three to four dates. That gives us a lot more uh, legal room to work with. I do book up early. I do book up quickly. Um, so don't email me tomorrow saying, hey, what are you doing on Friday? Because uh, I'm already booked. Uh, but do please email me. I'd love to hear from you. I really want to thank Dennis and everyone at Peoria All About Society for having me here. I was supposed to do three talks in the Peoria area between January and April of 2020. Between the weather and COVID, I did one. Um, but I really enjoyed doing that one talk. And I, it was my first time in the Peoria area. I thought it was fascinating and beautiful. I had no idea the Illinois River was so huge. My gosh. Um, and thank you, whether you're in Peoria or anywhere else, for coming tonight. Really appreciate your interest and time. And I am more than happy to take your questions now while I leave up my information. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. We've had a number of questions come in during the talk. And I'll just go through them one at a time at this point. So the first question is, what do you believe is the biggest misconception of owls, specifically great horned owls? Ooh, that is a fascinating question. Thank you. The biggest misconception about owls in general really varies on where you're talking about owls. Over And, and by that, I mean one of the biggest challenges with owls is how owls are viewed in many different cultures. A fascinating aspect about owls and humans is across human history and human cultures, people respond very strongly to owls. It can be positively, it can be ambivalently, it can be negatively, it can be all three at once, but far too often it is in a negative fashion, often associated with local beliefs and you know what people call would term as superstitions and things like that but viewing owls in a negative way and then behaving in a negative way to owls and not realizing how beneficial they are uh and their important ecological role so many owls are so important in controlling rodent populations and things like that it's one of the the best things we can have so just helping change people's attitudes about owls. Um, biggest misconception about great horned owls? That's a, gosh, I might have to sleep on that one. Um, <laughs> one of the bi biggest, maybe not a misconception, but a, 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 mis, a misnomer, misthought is that phrase hoot owl. Well, one of the problems with the phrase hoot owl is that some people will say, oh, I saw a hoot owl, and they know they're thinking about a great horned owl. And the person they're talking to might be thinking about a barn owl. It's the same problem, uh, I'm a big snake fan, and I, when people see black rat snakes, or also known as western rat snakes, they say, oh, it's a black snake. There's a lot of other snakes, just in Missouri and Illinois, that are black. Um, so being specific, say, yeah, hoot owl, it's a nice folk vernacular term, not especially helpful. 
um, because owls poop. <laughs> That's very good. Uh, another question is, what is the average lifespan for a great horned owl? And do males live longer than females? Mm. Very key question. Thank you. One of the, the fascinating dynamics about great horned owls, and it's one of the things that is a constant inspiration in my work, is that even though they are the most widespread commonly found owl in North America, there's still a great deal we do not know about them including average lifespan in the wild. We simply do not have that information. We do have records of longevity in the wild. The record longevity of the wild, those records go into their 20s. Now, if I could ask Charles one question, it would be, how old are you? Now, I have a minimum age based on two key points of data. One, great horn owls, generally don't have young until they're two to three years old. In the first year, I saw Charles and Sarah, they had young. Two, I've been studying Charles now for 15 years. So Charles is at least 17 to 18. He could be 19, he could be 22. When he disappeared for those six weeks this summer, given his advancing age and his the complete lack of sights and sounds of Charles, that really led me to think more than say if it, that had happened four years ago or eight years ago, that he had likely died because he is well past middle age. Um, so do males live longer than females? We also don't have any data on that. Um, pairs really are quite monogamous. They're gonna stay together as long as they can. But as you've seen, things, things have happened. Uh, if I could have asked Sarah any question, it would have been, how old are you? Sarah may have been older than Charles. I don't know. She was at least, again, based on the same two points of data, Sarah was at least 11 to 13 when she died. But was she 18? Was she 25? Thank you. Excellent question. Mm -hmm. Another question is, how large is their territory? I'm sure it could range, so it would be a variety in that range, but how large would the uh, your territory be typically? As I mentioned, there's a lot of variations in territory size. Decent rule of thumb, about a square mile. Now, while we haven't noticed a physical decline in Charles, you know, Charles isn't flying with a cane or a walker or anything like that. We have noticed in the past few years, Charles not going out as far to hunt and poops and declare territory. And in Forest Park's massive size, there are very few places that I haven't seen Charles, but there are fewer places in recent years that I have seen Charles. Not only that, we've seen other males coming closer to his territory. This other male that Charles's possible new mate has been calling with, this male has his territory or a kind of the base of his territory, the core of his territory, in what was not all that long ago, historically, part of Charles's territory. So it's, you know, one of those bittersweet things of, you know, Charles has had this great, for lack of a better word, brain, and he's made a big ripple, but that time is becoming smaller, as is his range and territory. So general rule of thumb with great horned owls, not always applicable as any rule of thumb, but about a square mile. Thank you. Okay. Another question is, does their head turn the same number of degrees to the left as to the right? Oh yeah, oh yeah. There's no right-headed owls or left-headed great horned owls. On the horizontal axis, they can turn their head at times just shy of 270 degrees. And on the vertical axis, just shy of 180 degrees. And that's achieved through incredible flexible necks. We humans have seven vertebrae in our necks, um, but owls have 14. Yeah. And even if we could, with our skeletal system, turn our heads, we would soon pass out because unlike owls, our air and blood pathways don't turn as well. And recent 
uh, study has demonstrated that yes, the air and blood pathways of owls turns as their head turns. So incredible, incredible biology and anatomy. Okay. Do the owlets stay in the territory in which they were born throughout their lifespan? They do not. Uh, I mentioned a keyword uh, a few times, dispersal. They eventually leave the parents' territory. Again, dependent on their parents' territory for a heck of a long time, but they really have to leave. Dispersal, it is a bittersweet thing to see, but it really has to happen. And it's key for two reasons. If the owlets stayed there, they would just wipe out the prey populations. Right. Two, you want to keep that gene pool nice and rich and healthy and spreading the family out is really key. I just finished uh, an article in the new issue of uh, Audubon about scrub jays in Florida where they're trying to help desperately because they're so inbred because of the horrible combination of habitat loss and just behavior of the, the baby scrub jays hang out for years, sometimes more with their parents. Uh, so they've actually been trying to introduce scrub jays from other areas to increase the genetic diversity because the lack of gen genetic diversity along with the decline in habitat is this double, triple whammy on the population of scrub jays. Uh, so with great point owls, it's really, for the vast majority of great point owls, the only time in their life cycle that they travel a great distance. Dispersal averages uh, 40 to 70, 50 to 80, even up, uh, you know, be 60 to 100 miles away. It can be much shorter, one to three miles away. Um, an owlet was found, a great horned owl uh, that had been banded was found in Western Illinois. Well, big deal. They're native to Western Illinois. Well, yeah, but it was hatched and banded 1,200 miles to the west in Alberta. So that's an extreme on the long distance dispersal. Okay. Do owls eject the pellets the same time of the day, such as when they go to roost? Um, going to roost would be in the morning. Pellet ejection is not always, but usually more as they're becoming active around sunset and into the evening. And I've seen early pellet ejection. I saw Charles eject the pellet a couple months ago, like two hours after sunset. Um, a lot depends on when they eat, when they ate, uh, what they ate, and things like that. But it's generally more of a post wake up time activity. Um, but if they caught something during the day, they might eject it earlier as a result of that. Another question is, do great horned owls use nesting boxes very often? Great horned owls do uh, respond uh, to artificial nest structures. Uh, it's often more of a platform than a uh, box, like uh, say a screech owl or a barn owl. Um, examples of structures and platforms that great horned owls have used is uh, a large tire with wood underneath the tire and wood along the tire fitting that tire and frame into a tree. An incredible thing about great horned owls is they nest in more different spaces and places than any other bird in the Americas. Duck, dove, warbler, wren. I can show you great horned owl nest sites because I've seen them used. If you dump me in the middle of somewhere that I didn't know, I might be able to show you potential nest sites, but unless you know that a great horned owl is nested there or has nested there, very hard to point to a spot and say, that's a great horned owl's nest. Contrast that with a bald eagle or an American robin. Yeah. Um, and they use many different man-made sites, not just, oh, we built this for a great horned owl, but the great horned owl is saying, yeah, that works. Another person asked, uh, I have heard that nesting females can be aggressive and territorial. What is your advice for being safe? Thank you. That is a very key question. Um, I was just having that discussion very recently with someone. Yes, female great owls are notoriously aggressive when they are nesting. 
And the best thing to do is to keep a very, very healthy, respectful distance from the nest. Um, if, you know, it doesn't matter. If you want to get a picture or a better picture, no, no, no. Stay away. Not only for your well-being and safety, but very importantly, the owl's well-being. One, one thing I always consider and not just consider, you know, well, I'll think about it. No, one thing I would actively work on is and think of is that, yes, Forest Park is visited by 13 million people, but we all go home. And when I'm there, I'm in their home. And when you're in an owl's territory, whether it's your backyard or your local park or what have you, you're in their home. You need to be a good guest. Um, another way to think about this is, remember, this is an animal that eats raccoons. And I'm guessing the person who asked the question, and pretty much everyone in the room, would not mess with the raccoon. Don't mess with an animal that does mess with raccoons. Um, so yes, they are very aggressive. Um, a good rule of thumb, you want to watch an owl, you want to find an owl, do your best imitation of an owl. Remember the dark muted colors, I move quietly, I talk quietly, uh, except when someone goes for a bath. Um, you just want to be very respectful. Um, and the scientists that go up to great horned owl nests to ban youngsters and count eggs and things like that, they would not be wearing a soft cap, hockey goalie mask, construction hard hat with face shield, not a hopefully stylish Italian blazer, but padded clothing. One scientist described the impact of an attacking female great horned owl uh, as follows. He said it was like getting clubbed and stabbed all at once. Hmm. Okay. Thank you. Key question. question is, what time of year do the baby owls hatch? Well, in, in this part of their range, uh, I, I would say, you know, whether Peoria or St. Louis, uh, hatching in mid to late February. But if I was having this conversation in Florida, or Alaska, the answer would be very different. Again, with the, they are one of the first, if not the first bird's nest, but the timing of nests will vary uh, geographically, primarily north and south. Um, but in kind of this middle of the Midwest, uh, hatching in uh, mid to late March. But depending on the type of nest, and the nest location and everything else, the, the general context of that, you might not see owlets for a few weeks after that. Um, that could be a very challenging uh, uh, bit of time, just waiting patiently for the first flips of the owlets, but uh, it's worth it. Okay. How do you determine the sexes of the owlets? Well, it's not what quite what engineers describe as a WAG, a W-A-G, a wild ass gag. Yeah. Um, I've got about a 50-50 shot of being right and of being wrong. Um, now back to that, what I mentioned, how there's still so much we don't know about great horn owls. One of the many things we don't know about great horn owls is the overall sex ratio. How many ladies, how many bellies. They're not endangered. Their uh, IUCN status, the International Union of the Conservation of Nature, is the best it can be, a species of non-concern. But how many females do they have? How many males? I have no idea. How many great horned owls do you believe are in Forest Park in St. Louis? I know currently of three, possibly four pairs. Um, What's harder to enumerate is the number of single owls, whether it's great horned or barred or northern saw wet. Single owls are called floaters and they're harder to find. They're often not vocal or barely vocal. Um, they can and will overlap with the territory of a pair, um, but the floater is going to keep a very low quiet profile 
Um, but these great horn owls are so adaptable. I've seen them as well as other owl species, but especially great horn and barred owls all over the St. Louis region, uh, not just big parks like Forest Park, but neighborhoods and yards of every stripe and size, same with parks and other good established green spaces, golf courses, campuses. It's amazing where you'll find them. Okay. Do you think it is possible that rodent pesticides used in the area by residents could have caused some of the owls to become ill? That is unfortunately a distinct possibility. Um, with Samantha's death, it was a bacterial infection. I have no idea what caused Sarah's death, but the World Bird Sanctuary who cared for her were unable to determine the cause of the infection. Now, was it a wound? Was it an injury? Was it secondary rodenticide poisoning? Um, and yes, the park is big, and thankfully the park does not use rodenticide, but neighbor B, neighbor K, not far from the park, could. Um, and yes, uh, and, and thank you for that, that question. Uh, secondary poisoning is a huge problem, and not just for great horned owls, but anything and everything that eats rodents. Um, so if you have a problem with rodents, if you have to use poison, dispose of the animal very carefully. Don't just throw it out in the backyard. Try not to use poison, use physical traps. Try to attract natural predators. Great horned owls, black rat snakes have been evolving for millions of years to be the best mouse trap there could be. Uh, so please go keep those things in mind. Okay. Have you ever seen two different owls fight over a territory? Hmm. Oh yeah, oh yeah. So when uh, Samantha came in in April 2016, before she shoved out Olivia and started chasing Charles around, there's a massive territorial confrontation. On one side, Charles and Olivia, and on the other side, the intruding female who eventually became Samantha. And that included very intense hooting and Charles and who became Samantha literally flying at each other. And I have seen territorial intrusions over the years. Uh, and again, in, in the last few years, other males getting closer and closer to Charles. We now have this one male literally living in a spot that I used to spend hours watching Charles hunt in. I haven't seen Charles in that area for a few years now. So yes, highly territorial. And when an intruder comes in, the resident pair does not contact their lawyers and you know the intruder gets a firm but precise email saying, see, please, you know, cease and desist. No, they get the heck out of here. Okay, we're starting now to get into a few comments and a couple of personal questions here. Well, uh, one, one is such a clever phrase, owl prowl. So uh some of the other individuals may have never been on an owl prowl, and so I, I take no credit for that. I, I wish I could. If I if I could come up with that phrase, owl prowl, I, I, I would have a been thrilled, and b were copyrighted and trademarked the hell out of it. Another person was wondering what your daytime job is. I tried to give it at the early introduction, but uh, I think I may have uh, kind of blown through it. Oh, no problem. Um, I've worked in higher education for the last uh, about 18, 17 years um, in a few different roles. Uh, currently, I'm at Pompon University, where I'm the manager of university services. And uh, I've been at Pompon in two different capacities. Uh, this is a new one for me. And uh, it's uh, really cool because they're very supportive of the owls if I work with them. Uh, and the campus is 0.9 miles from Forest Park. So I literally drive, I could drive from my home to, to Papa University in about 10 minutes, but I go out of my way each morning to drive through the park. The last comment we have here is, thank you, I'll be in touch. I would really enjoy exploring Forest Park with you with an owl prowl. Lovely, thank you, glad to hear that, very kind.
And with that, we are out of the questions for right now. And uh, on behalf of Peoria Audubon Society and all of our members and supporters, we really appreciate your taking the time to speak with us for answering all the questions about owls. It's a, truly a very fascinating topic and hope everybody uh, is better informed. So thank you very much. You're very welcome, Dennis. Thank you. Thank everyone. Have a great night. Okay. Goodbye, everyone.